much um, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and um, just by way of kind of introducing myself a little bit, I kind of come into journalism uh, a little bit as an outsider. My, uh, my scholarly training was in computer science. Uh, I'm now a professor of journalism. So I've uh, successfully gone behind enemy lines and I'm uh, doing computational journalism, uh, sort of a mixture of computer science and journalism. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit today about some ideas I've been um, working on for the last couple of years related to algorithmic accountability and transparency. So I'm going to kick this off uh, with an example. So who here is familiar with Uber? OK, so I, I, most of you. So I actually checked yesterday uh, when I got in to see if Uber was available in health safety. And it is, although it doesn't seem to be terribly popular. Uh, there were a few cars that were available. Anyway, this is a big thing in the US. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with it, uh, the basic idea is that it's um, uh, you click a button and a car shows up and takes you wherever you want to go. Uh, so it's very convenient. Um, it's made it very easy to get around. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the premise is that uh, people can sign up, ordinary people can sign up as what, what are called UberX drivers in the US. I think it's called something else in Europe. Uh, but they can use their own car to make some additional cash on the side, uh, as basically as a taxi driver. So you might not have seen the other end of this app, which is uh, another Uber app that sits on the driver's dashboard. Uh, and when you request a, a, a ride in your app at your location, uh, a driver gets a ping, a little blue dot on their map, uh, and they have 15 seconds to decide whether or not they're going to come pick you up or, or whether or not they want to accept that, uh, that ride. So this is all algorithmically determined, right? We have automated systems that are trying to constantly match uh, demand for rides and supply of rides. The other aspect of Uber that's, automatic, that's automatically and algorithmically controlled um, is the price. So you might have heard of the idea of surge pricing. Um, the, the price varies dynamically over time, uh, you know, anywhere up to, I think, uh, 9 or 10x uh, the normal base fare. Uh, and the, the rhetoric of the company is basically that, uh, you know, they're trying to optimize supply and demand. And if you raise the price uh, dynamically, that should have the, play the dual roles of decreasing demand, because people don't want to pay more for a ride, as well as increasing supply. Uh, because Uber argues uh, if a driver sees that they can make more money uh, with a higher surge price, then magically they'll jump in their car and go pick you up. So what's really interesting to me about this is that we don't really know how surge pricing works. It's, it's essentially a black box. There's some information we can get reading patents that have been filed uh, by Google and so on, but we don't really know. We don't know <coughs> if or how the weather might be affecting surge prices that we're seeing. We don't know what the relationship of surge pricing is to locations. Uh, so are we going to pay more prices in, in one area than another? We don't know if the destination that you're asking to be taken to uh, plays a role in this. We don't know if, for instance, my history, my user history, is playing a role. So I've taken probably at least 100 rides on Uber at this point over the last couple of years. Uh, so Uber has a nice history profile on me. And they know what's the maximum I've ever paid, where, where do I usually take a car, what times of day do I usually take a car. Are they mining that in some way, or are they dynamically uh, using that to adjust the price that I see? We don't even know if the price that I see in my app is the same price that drivers are paying or shown okay, in terms of the certain prices that they see. So essentially, we don't know if certain prices work and if they do, how they work. So it was kind of with that thinking in mind that a couple of years ago, um, after Uber, actually right after Uber opened up uh, an API, uh, that we started gathering data. And I started working with some undergraduate students on this at the time. So we had five different locations in Washington, D.C., which is where I live. Uh, and we started tracking um, what, what's the surge price at each moment in time. And we tried you know, every second to see if, you know, how frequently the price was changing. Uh, and then eventually we backed off and we were gathering data every 15 seconds. Uh, and we started generating graphs like this, the, the one that you see at the top. So this is showing 12 hours of data 
on uh, one day in March of 2015. And so <laughs> at a sort of course level, you know, the, the, the graph gives you the impression that the price is changing pretty frequently, right? It's kind of jumping up and down. Um, and those step sizes are actually fairly substantial. So it's starting at one at the bottom and it's going up to three at the top. So each step size could be anywhere from 0.5x to 1x. Uh, and maybe what you can't see at this scale is that the price is changing pretty frequently, every three minutes in some cases. So this starts to cast some doubts on Uber's corporate rhetoric that search prices would actually get more drivers on the road. Because if the price is changing every three minutes, how likely is it that, that some driver is going to be sitting there looking at their app, see the price go up, and be ready and in their car to pick you up within three minutes? highly unlikely. So this was kind of a thread that we wanted to pull on a little bit. So we started, I mentioned, we, we collected data in five different neighborhoods. Um, and what I started to look at was the relationship between adjacent neighborhoods. So what this graph is showing is actually the price difference uh, from three to minus two uh, between two of those adjacent neighborhoods. So um, uh, uh, Three on this on this axis means that uh, the search price is larger in neighborhood A than it is in neighborhood B, and vice versa. And what you're seeing on the y-axis is actually the estimated waiting time to receive a car. So this is kind of our proxy for service quality. How long are you going to be sitting waiting once you press the button for a car? So what this correlation is showing then is that when you have a higher price in neighborhood A. Um, compared to neighborhood B, you actually uh, uh, end up waiting less time in neighborhood A for uh, a car than in neighborhood B. So if you kind of think about that uh, for a second, one interpretation of that, um, of that correlation is that higher price in neighborhood A, drivers swarm toward that neighborhood because, hey, I can make more money over there. But what that means is that neighborhood B now has less cars available to pick people up. So you end up waiting longer for a car in neighborhood B, and uh, you have a shorter wait in neighborhood A. So this is kind of, a, kind of an interesting result, um, and one which I think points out uh, some, some interesting questions, right? That we don't necessarily know how search pricing is affecting different neighborhoods or whether or not it's fair that one neighborhood has a different price than another. Um, but there do seem to be some patterns that we can pick up on based on the data that we collected. So we actually followed this up uh, more recently. This is a story, this is from a story that we published um, last month, March, uh, at the Washington Post, uh, where we were looking at the relationship between service quality, that is estimated waiting time for a car, and neighborhood demographics, so using census information. And what this map is showing that in, in some areas of Washington, D.C., uh, where you see red, people have much higher waiting times uh, than in other, other areas of the city. In, in yellow, you have the lowest waiting times. So, so as you might expect, things that are closer to the center of the city have a lower waiting time. There's more density there. There's more supply of drivers there. And things toward the edges of the city tend to have higher waiting times. But when you start plugging in and looking at demographic characteristics, you start to see some interesting trends. Now, in this graph, this is actually a result of a linear model that we built, which takes into account <coughs> uh, uh, the search price, the, sorry, the uh, estimated waiting time that you're looking for, uh, that, that someone has to wait uh, as the outcome variable, and uh, several uh, input variables, including um, the, the, uh, the uh, racial composition of the neighborhood, so number of percentage of pe uh, people of color, as well as median income, poverty rate, and density of people. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a normalized model, but what it's showing is that there's a relationship between the number of people of color in the neighborhood of the city and how long you would expect to wait for a car, <coughs> controlling for all these other factors like median income, density, and so on. So um, this, I think, kind of, again, underscores this idea that there's some disparities in terms of service quality. Now, why does this matter? Well, Uber is starting to talk about um, kind of business relationships with cities, actually has some pilot business relationships with some cities, not, not DC yet. 
Uh, but as these types of corporate systems, which are largely running on black box algorithms that the public has no access to, uh, if we want those systems to be equitable and the benefits of those systems to be fairly shared by all, then we kind of need to start pushing on companies like Uber to open up a little bit more and uh, share some of this data or start addressing these types of disparities. So all of that was kind of a long introduction into this notion of uh, the idea that algorithms are everywhere, right? Not just in dynamic pricing systems in your apps, but uh, they're used throughout governments and industry, uh, everything from political messaging and urban planning to welfare management, uh, criminal sentencing. Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, used in Europe at all, but in the US, uh, some states are starting to use uh, algorithms for sentencing, parole, um, and bail, and so on. Uh, and of course, throughout the media. So everything from um, you know, the way in which reviews are moderated or are ranked uh, to news personalization, recommendations, and search rankings and completions, which I'll talk about more later. Of course, another area where algorithms are now playing a role is in um, dating. So I like this cartoon from The New Yorker from a couple of years ago where you have this annoying woman looking back at this guy saying, I'd like to meet the algorithm that thought we did a match. <laughs> so algorithms really are everywhere in, in all facets of our lives. But why I like this cartoon is that it's kind of putting its finger on an important issue, which is that, yes, these systems are being used more and more to help us make decisions. In some cases, they're autonomous. And in other cases, they're aiding human decision making. But oftentimes, we don't have enough visibility into how those automated decisions are made. Uh, these systems are largely opaque, they're largely black box, uh, sometimes for good reasons. Um, and, but I think that as journalists, we need to start thinking about how to scrutinize these types of systems. And that is really where the idea of algorithmic accountability comes in. Um, this is something I've been thinking about for the last couple of years, is how do we investigate these types of algorithmic systems that are used in government or industry or media how can we actually start to characterize the bias or the power or the influence of these types of systems? Uh, can we start peeling back uh, some, some layers of how these systems work to um, tell stories to the public about the ways in which these uh, algorithms are affecting our lives and society? And as a journalist, I'm interested in the role that journalists can play in holding algorithmic power accountable. So to the extent that for, for a long time now, journalism has been about speaking truth to power um, and, uh, <coughs> and investigating power, power institutions in society. I think algorithms uh, as entities or algorithmic systems, which is probably more accurate, um, how can actually start to scrutinize those systems and hold that type of power accountable? So I think it's helpful to point out some of the kind of atoms of algorithmic decision making that are that, are, that can be important uh, for investigation. So there are at least four different atomic decisions that uh, I've seen algorithms making. There might be others. Um, prioritization is a very important one. Uh, so just creating a ranking uh, and information. This is something uh, we see on a daily basis with search engines. Uh, it can actually be really useful. Um, so the city of New York, for instance, ranks all of the buildings in the city uh, for um, risk of fire, and they use that ranking to help orient the attention of inspectors, fire inspectors, uh, so that they can uh, focus their attention, their, their limited inspection attention on the buildings that are highest risk. So that's a good thing, right? Because they can, they can actually get to the buildings um, that are worst off. Uh, algorithms are used in classification decisions, so is it A or B or C? Um, this is used uh, in many different areas of society. Um, for instance, are you on the no-fly list that the U.S. government maintains? Uh, actually, there's been some reporting that's shown that there are predictive systems that classify you as terrorist or not terrorist, and that can actually be used as an input to get you on that list. Um, there are other examples of that throughout online media uh, of using classification. Uh, association, so creating a relationship between two different things. Um, that's something uh, that comes up again in different contexts. Uh, you might remember this case from a few years ago in Germany 
of uh, Bettina Wolf, the um, wife of the former president of Ger Germany. If you typed her name in on a Google search, uh, you would actually see auto completions suggesting that she was a prostitute. Um, she was not happy about that association that had been made with her name. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the, uh, the system, the Google system, was reflecting that in the user interface. And uh, um, she eventually uh, won a case that she brought against the company, uh, a defamation case. Now, that wouldn't apply in the US, but in different parts of the world, there are different jurisdictions that would do that differently. So these types of associations can be consequential to individuals. Uh, and then finally, algorithms can filter content. And this uh, becomes interesting and important in cases of uh, censorship, for instance. So let me give you a few sort of concrete examples of kind of the, the, the power that algorithms play. So the first one I'll give is uh, the relationship of algorithms to, uh, to business and to business interests. So Yelp, um, folks here have used Yelp. I right, said, so, okay, most of you. It's an online uh, review system. Their tagline, real people, real reviews. Of course, the problem is some of those reviews actually aren't from real people. Uh, and that's where algorithms come into play. So they actually have uh, a system, uh, an algorithm that reads through the reviews and makes a determination, a classification. Is this fake or is this real? Um, so if I look at the aggregate rating for uh, a small business in New York, for instance, I see that New York Kitchen and Bath has a three-star average rating uh, based on 10 reviews, so not too many reviews. But I can also see that 67 reviews for that uh, business were filtered out. So that algorithm is really working overtime on New York Kitchen and Bath. Um, it's filtered out most of the reviews that were made. Now, to Yelp's credit, they, they don't actually delete those reviews. You can, you can actually access them. You just have to work a little bit harder. You have to click into the review system to see those. Uh, but where this is important is these uh, filter reviews don't contribute to the average star rating for the company. So it could be that they had filtered out all five-star reviews and their average would have been a lot higher. So from, from research that's been done on Yelp reviews, uh, we know that roughly one in six reviews are filtered out as fakes. Uh, but we also know that every classifier, every machine learning classifier is going to have some error rate associated with it. So their filter is imperfect. Uh, we might end up de-emphasizing legitimate reviews, or we might end up leaving fake reviews intact. Uh, and again, the, the ratio of those types of errors could have implications for the aggregate star rating. Now, why this matters to a business interest is that other research has shown that a one star level difference in your aggregate rating on Yelp actually can lead to five to nine percent increase in revenue. So that signal that's sent from Yelp to potential customers is a very strong signal. Uh, if you have a much higher rating, more people are interested in coming to your small business. So now you get a sense for why the error rate between these two types of errors of, of the filter uh, could actually have an impact. If you're filtering out more of the uh, fake five-star reviews, or sorry, if you're, if you're leaving more of the fake one-star reviews intact, that would drag down uh, your average. Another example where um, I think algorithms are particularly interesting and important for journalists to pay attention is in the media systems where we're consuming uh, news media. Now, many of these systems are now moderated by algorithmic processes of curation, Facebook newsfeed probably being the, the biggest, most important one uh, right now. Um, this slide actually comes from um, a presentation from a few years ago where Facebook had, had shown that they had done a study of uh, voter turnout during the 2012 elections. Uh, and what they were studying was whether or not showing someone more hard news in their news feed would get them to go vote. So they had two conditions. One, uh, boosted condition where they showed people more hard news, and the control condition, which was just the you know, standard vanilla Facebook news feed uh, that you get. And so you can see in these two panels, the top panel is showing for, for people, sorry, the bottom panel is showing people who logged in every day. The top panel is showing people who logged in uh, less frequently than every day, but at least once per month. Uh, and you can actually see the less frequent log, log beginners uh, had a, a higher uh, mean turnout in the boosted condition. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if Facebook shows you more 
hard news in your news feed, you're more likely to go vote. That was the uh, interpretation of this data uh, from, from Facebook. Um, now, that could be a good thing, right? We could say, well, um, yeah, we want to improve voter turnout. But the danger, of course, is what happens when that's applied differentially to different political uh, schools of thought, right? Uh, you know, are we fairly applying this type of um, intervention to different people? And even if we're not, Facebook's uh, overall user base skews more Democratic than Republican. So even if they applied the boosting to everyone on Facebook, it would end up having more of an impact on uh, the Democratic turnout than the Republican turnout. Uh, so these become you know, important political issues and democratic issues of how people receive information and process that information. Another very important arbiter of information in today's age is Google. Um, I've been getting interested in, in uh, investigating Google algorithms for a few years now as well. I'll give you a few examples of things that I've been drilling into. So one is search engine autocompletions. So this is, you know, as you're typing in, you see a few suggestions uh, for other things um, that you might want to search for. Uh, this can obviously be very useful. It can save you time. Uh, it can help cue your memory to something that you didn't quite think you would uh, search for, but turned out to be very important. Um, and it's certainly orienting attention, right? It's making certain searches easier to get to than other searches. Now, if you read into the Google autocomplete fact, they say, we exclude a narrow class of search for it related to pornography, violence, hate speech, and copyright infringement. OK, great. That's very interesting. And you know, kudos to Google for trying to filter out facts that would uh, make it easier for people to find uh, some of the nasty stuff on, on the internet. <coughs> but what's less clear is you know, if we start to think of this in kind of a censorship model, and it's not really censorship in the sense that you know, we're not deleting anything, we're just making it more difficult to find some information from, from other information. But we don't really know the boundaries of any of, the, of any of those filters. What are the boundaries of what constitutes violence or hate speech or pornography on Google? And could there be some mistakes that are getting through? So here's the obligatory warning. Um, I've never done this presentation in Finland, so I hope no one's um, <laughs> put off by this. But this was published a couple of years ago um, in Slate, and what we're interested in is looking at uh, auto-completions by Google and Bing um, for porno pornography-related search terms. So build a dictionary of porno terms based on uh, um, uh, academic dictionaries as well as um, more online types of uh, slang dictionaries, and basically, um, automatically went through and typed in those words to see which ones would get auto-completed and which ones would not get auto-completed. So this gives us a sense of what are the boundaries of censorship in this domain uh, in terms of what the search engines are not going to help us find. So you can see words blocked by Google uh, are in um, blue. And by blocked, I mean they didn't return suggestions. Uh, words blocked by Bing are in red, and words blocked by both are in purple. So right off the bat, you can see that Google is a little bit more conservative in terms of the terms that it's blocked in. Um, but you can also see a lot of stuff that's not blocked. Uh, and the question is, could some of those um, search terms actually lead to content that we might not want them to lead to, like um, child pornography? So in another search, I actually uh, drilled into this issue of child pornography um, and added child plus the search term to see if that would autocomplete. Uh, and you can see that both the search engines are a lot more um, uh, strict here in terms of what they block. You see a lot more terms uh, that, are not, um, that are not censored uh, in terms of what will be autocompleted. But again, you still see some terms that will get autocompleted. And some of those are totally legitimate anatomical terms uh, that you might actually want someone to be able to search on, uh, even in relationship to your child. But other of these terms actually um, are more problematic, things like uh, child lust or child lover, that if you actually executed that search would uh, give you a set of links that would lead you to child pornography. Um, and so that, this is kind of where the accountability piece comes into these types of investigations. 
um, you know, we, we, we sort of approach this with the notion of, well, we want to understand what's being censored and what's not, but what we come away with is actually seeing that um, there are actually some mistakes of uh, information that's being left through this filter uh, that we might actually want to have blocked um, for public safety reasons. Another dimension of this that I'm getting very interested in is relates to regular search engine results, uh, the standard search engine results. There was a very interesting paper published um, late last year uh, called the Search Engine Manipulation Effect, SEME. Uh, and what they, uh, what they published in that paper was a series of experiments that showed that uh, uh, if you prioritize very pro results for one political candidate at, at the top of the rankings and had uh, only negative results at the bottom of the rankings, that you could actually push people to have a predilection to vote for either of those candidates. So these are the different conditions of their experiment. Uh, you know, they, they used real, uh, real politicians, although they were all essentially lab studies. Uh, so they were using a, you know, their own a uh, search engine that they built to be able to control it completely. Uh, but what's really interesting is actually when you get into some of these later conditions, they actually showed that um, they could mask people's ability to see that the results were biased. So in condition A or B, where you have you know, very pro uh, results for one candidate or the other, people, some people at least, uh, a, you know, a sizable fraction of people could tell that the results were biased. But even with just one result to kind of throw you off, people were very unable or much, much less able to detect um, the bias in the rankings. Um, so again, this is kind of an important result in the sense that a lot of people are getting political information from search engines, and we don't necessarily know um, how the information that people are being presented with um, could be affecting their, their voting tendencies. So again, all these studies were done in the laboratory environment. What I've been getting interested in doing is actually looking at, at real data, uh, like you know what you see when you search for Hillary Clinton on Google. Uh, and something we published again in Slate um, late last year was we actually looked at search result pages for all of the um, uh, primary candidates in the U.S. In last December when we ran this, uh, there were still like over a dozen, uh, so we were looking at hundreds of results, uh, and we were looking at sort of the, the, the number of results on the first page that were pro the candidate versus con the candidate, so it's kind of support opposition uh, framework, and we got ratings of all those pages uh, in order to aggregate the results. And so this is kind of what we saw, again, this is from uh, early December last year. Um, we have the result rank, so that's the position one through 10 on the first page, and then we came up with uh, favorability score, which is the average of uh, three ratings of different raters uh, looking at kind of the support opposition spectrum. Um, so Democrats are more favorable uh, in total than Republican candidates. So that's kind of interesting that uh, Democrats have more kind of favorable information that's surfacing on the, on the front page of their search results than, than compared to Republicans. Uh, and you also see this trend of both kind of dropping off. So you have higher favorability at the top of the page and uh, lower favorability at the bottom of the page. So at the top of the page, you're seeing things like social media accounts, Facebook pages, Twitter, Instagram, stuff that the campaign themselves control. So they're very closely controlling the image of their campaign. Hey, they have good SEO consultants, right? They're doing their job. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that you see a disparity between the two camps. At the bottom of the results is where you start to see negative news articles come in, and that's why you have a lower average there. So if there's going to be some kind of negative coverage, we often saw it in those eight, nine, and 10 positions. So looking at this a little bit differently, um, kind of breaking out across candidates, again, there were a lot of candidates uh, last December when we were looking at this. Republicans at the top, Democrats at the bottom. More orange is more con uh, types of results, and more purple is, is more pro, gray is neutral. Uh, so a couple things pop out here. Again, you see that trend of there's more con and very con results uh, about the Republicans that come up. Uh, we also see Bernie Sanders. Man, he's doing great with the SEO. He's got nine very pro pages that surfaced on his first page of results, and only one neutral one. So nothing, nothing bad about Bernie. <laughs> So his social media team, or his SEO team, is really um, earning a fee. Yeah. 
So in thinking about this a little bit more abstractly, the way that uh, I've been approaching these types of projects um, you know, in my lab is thinking about a black box uh, and thinking about the input-output um, relationships of that black box. And thinking about, well, how do we connect these two, right? If we, if we uh, change the inputs in a million different ways and look at the outputs, of a million different outputs of those inputs, we can start to draw some correlations between those two. Um, we can't really pierce the black box. We can't understand exactly the relationship between these two things. Uh, it's a little bit more like science, you know, running a science experiment. You don't know, I don't understand, or a biologist, a biologist doesn't understand exactly how a cell works, but they just poke it a lot of different ways in a controlled fashion, and they look at how that cell responds. So we're kind of approaching the study of these types of systems in the same way. Now there's different types of scenarios that you encounter in practice. Uh, one is where you have um, ready, readily available access to both the inputs and the outputs of an algorithm. So I, for instance, for the Uber API, I can send the Uber API different locations, and it will send me back the price in that location. So this is kind of a best case scenario where I have access to both the inputs and outputs. I can vary the inputs in a million different ways and look at how it responds. But sometimes we also run into cases like this, where maybe I can see the output of an algorithm, but I have absolutely no control of the input of that system. Uh, and this, this actually comes up very often in government scenarios, uh, where, for instance, there was a case in New York where they had published all of the teacher uh, rankings for the city, uh, but you didn't know any of the inputs that had been fed into their uh, ranking system. And so you could, couldn't necessarily see the connections. <coughs> And then other times you're going to run into algorithms that are behind some institutional barrier. You have no access to either the inputs or the outputs. And this is, of course, very frustrating. Uh, in some cases, we can use uh, freedom of information laws to uh, transition this scenario into this scenario where the outputs are perhaps FOIA-able documents that we can ask the government to provide for us. So it's, it's easy to illustrate this model with this Wall Street Journal uh, story. I love, this, I love this story. This is actually a few years old now. Uh, but um, basically what these reporters did was um, they wanted to understand uh, whether or not people see different prices online at various e-commerce uh, sites. Um, and does the geography or the user profile that's represented in their browser affect the prices that they see? So, the, the, their black box in this case was staples.com. Staples is an office supply company. Um, so you, know, you buy like paper and staples there. So, um, so the inputs, they were sending different um, geographies and different cookie profiles to represent different types of users. Uh, and then they were reporting on the output, the prices that people were seeing. And they, based on that data that they collected, they were able to draw maps like this, where you could start to see, uh, this is a map of Iowa. Um, uh, dark gray are lower prices, uh, dark green are higher prices. Uh, you can start to see certain trends in the data that, that they've collected. So, uh, for instance, more rural areas uh, are, are green and dark green, and more urban areas are in gray and dark gray. And where this gets very interesting is when you overlay um, the locations of actual staple stores as well as their competitors. So, Stable stores are in red, and competitor stores are in blue. And now that the the, uh, the trend pops out a little bit more clearly, you see that uh, where Staples has a store and no competition, it's offering people the higher prices. Uh, where it does have competition, it's offering a lower prices. So pretty, uh, pretty uh, standard type business behavior, trying to optimize um, your revenue based on competition, but also raises some interesting questions like, hmm. You know, people who live in rural areas tend to be less socioeconomically managed. So they might not have as much disposable income to spend uh, at stables. And do we really want to be showing them the higher prices rather than the more wealthy urban dwellers? So there's a lot of challenges to doing algorithmic accountability stories. Um, you know, I've been doing uh, a few of these um, a year for the past few years, uh, and it's, I always feel a little bit left, uh, left, let down at the end, to be quite honest with you. It's, it's very hard to get hard proof uh, for any of these observations. 
And that's because looking at input-output relationships really just leaves you with correlations, right? And, and you have to be careful about how you interpret correlations and what they really mean uh, and thinking about other interpretations of the data. Uh, I lack internal knowledge of these systems, right? I don't know how they were built. I don't know how quickly they're changing. I don't know the decision processes that go into building these systems. So again, that's a challenge to interpreting the data that we're seeing. Interviews are important. Um, you know, because I don't have internal knowledge, talking to people at these companies uh, becomes very important, but it can be adversarial because sometimes you're coming to a company and you're saying, huh, kind of looks like you're screwing the, these neighborhoods over. Um, you know, what do you have to say about that? Uh, and so that can make them uh, a little bit uncomfortable uh, or might make them not want to talk to you. Uh, and ultimately, as I mentioned, it's difficult to answer why you know, for a lot of these stories. There are certainly legal and regulatory issues. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, uh, so if you decide to do any algorithmic compatibility investigations, please talk to your local um, organizational lawyer. Um, there's terms of use issues. A lot of uh, companies don't want to be using their APIs to gather data uh, and analyze it. In fact, uh, the first story that I ran on Uber, uh, when I called them up and said, hey, I'm looking at you know your pricing data and I found some things in it. They said, say what? No, we're not, we're not answering your questions. You're, um, you're using our API in a way that's not allowed. Therefore, we're not going to answer any questions. So it took them about 24 hours to come back to me and say, uh, well, actually, I guess we'll talk to you. Um, but you know, depending on your interpretation of the terms of use, it could go either way. Um, there's other laws in the US that are specific to that jurisdiction. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act um, is, a, is a serious one that the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, is looking into uh, as something that could potentially have a chilling effect on this type of um, research. Uh, freedom of information, something I mentioned a little bit before. Um, there are also limitations uh, in terms of how well that can even work for algorithmic systems. So um, in some cases, for some federal agencies in the US, they say explicitly, you can't FOIA software. Software is a non-FOIAable document. Uh, and this also goes for some states in the US at that level. Um, there's trade secret issues. So one of the exemptions that people can ask for, uh, or that, um, sorry, one of the exemptions that uh, governments will, will often give uh, when you ask for this type of information is that it's proprietary. Um, perhaps they've bought an algorithm from someone else, or they're integrating another piece of software from someone else. Um, and so, you know, they, they can't, for contractual reasons, um, uh, disclose that. And so when you send in your FOIA, they'll just they, they'll just cite that exception and say, we can't give it to you. Uh, and there's this other issue of document creation. So FOIA in the US uh, only goes for documents that already exist. So if a document doesn't already, you know, isn't already available, um, they won't create it for you. So you could imagine that uh, some kind of algorithm could be running the classifier and could determine that your race, for instance, uh, based on a set of input variables. And it might even use that variable in, ter in terms of downstream decisions uh, that it makes. But if there's no output of that variable that says what it is, you would never be able to see that uh, uh, through a FOIA request. There are certain ethical implications. So whenever you get into publishing uh, information about how an algorithmic system works, you need to think very carefully about how that information could be used to gain that system. Um, other people may pick up on it and use it in a way that you didn't intend. So, uh, you know, maybe I can figure out how search, search ranking works around politicians. If I publish that, someone's going to start gaining it really aggressively. And is that the, is that the kind of uh, information that I want to allow people to create around politicians? There's other issues relating to individual privacy. Uh, certain, um, in certain cases, um, uh, deception becomes important. One of the methods for studying algorithms is actually creating different uh, puppet accounts uh, and actually deceiving the system into thinking that you're a thousand different people so that you can see, say, the Facebook news feed from a thousand different angles. But 
are you comfortable as a journalist um, essentially operating a deception where you're, where you're saying that you're a thousand different people? So if you're actually thinking practically about this, uh, about coming up with uh, algorithmic accountability investigations, um, there's at least six different kind of story types that I've seen that I think could, that, that you could get published. One is the algorithm that's discriminatory or unfair, so it's treating different people in different ways. Uh, another is a, a mistake that denies a service to someone, so this could be uh, interesting for like a, um, a government service. So there's, there was this case a few years ago in Boston where um, they started using face detection algorithms on driver's licenses to figure out if um, someone uh, had, was using like a uh, dual identity or was being fraudulent in their identity. Uh, and there was this case of this guy who the algorithm triggered, it thought he was a fraud, it thought you know, he was a repeat uh, license, and he wasn't. Uh, and, but because they, the state automatically um, uh, revoked his license, he was unable to drive uh, for his job and so on, and so uh, this was an issue. Censorship, I think, could be another uh, kind of an interesting story, uh, archetype. Um, an algorithm that breaks a law or a social norm, that could, that could be interesting. That would be a headline, right? Algorithm defames someone or breaks some law. Uh, a false prediction, right? So the outcome of some algorithmic process tells you to do something. Uh, doing that something ends up being the wrong thing to do, but it costs you a lot of money. Well, this actually happened. Uh, Hurricane Sandy hit uh, New York City a few years ago. And um, uh, the state of New Jersey was using a simulation uh, of the storm to decide whether or not they would evacuate all of the um, train cars from the rail yard. Uh, and the simulation said, no, no, you're fine. Like, this storm's not going to create you know, enough of a swell to, to flood this area. Well, turns out the software was wrong or was misconfigured, perhaps. Uh, and they lost millions and millions of dollars worth of train equipment because that whole yard got flooded. Uh, of course, you know. Mother Nature is, is another thing, but um, I think that's definitely deserving of uh, a story there in terms of how the government is used. Uh, lastly, violation of privacy. I think that can also be an interesting angle. Um, ultimately, we want to think about what are the consequences of algorithms for the public, for uh, personal interests, significance, and the number of people that will be affected. So we heard about this a little bit from the previous presentations. Um, so you know, I, I, I make this argument that journalists need to investigate the algorithms that are in industry and government. Uh, but it turns out that journalists are part of their own industry, right? And the news organizations are increasingly using automation and algorithms to produce the media, including uh, reports like this with narrative science where they're publishing earnings reports um, automatically based on data. Um, and there's certainly many other examples of the use of algorithms throughout uh, news organizations. So what do we do about that? The fact that we ourselves are using algorithms uh, and uh, need to operate them effectively and responsibly. So this is where the notion of transparency comes in. So uh, Mark um, defines transparency as the ways in which people both inside and external to journalism are given a chance to monitor, check, criticize, or even intervene in the journalistic process. So the question here is how do we apply this notion of transparency and, and really this norm of transparency that's grown up and, and has gotten a lot more powerful in the last few years, how do we apply that to algorithms? What does that look like? So about a year ago, I, I uh, ran a workshop at Columbia University at the House Center for Digital Journalism uh, where we got 50 people together to talk about algorithmic transparency. Uh, and specifically, we were looking at three different case studies. So automated news content, right? That's the stuff like narrative science and automated insights where they're using software to write articles. Algorithmic curation, uh, so could be something like Facebook news feed, but certainly uh, recommendation systems, personalization systems, um, uh, uh, comment moderation systems that are increasingly using algorithms to operate. Uh, and then finally, simulation and modeling. So actually using computing in the process of storytelling. Uh, and you see this oftentimes uh, with interactive graphics, where they're actually visualizing a model that you can interact with. Uh, and we were kind of discussing uh, several different questions here, like what could we even make public about these algorithms? What would be the little bits of information that we could disclose 
about how these systems are working so that uh, the publics that we service trust us more. What are the limits of algorithmic transparency? What, do, what can we absolutely not disclose? What should, what should we not disclose? Uh, where are the boundaries of transparency? And then what are disclosure mechanisms? What, is, what does disclosure actually look like around algorithms? Is it something we integrate into the interface so that while I'm interacting with your news website, there's some kind of hint of stepping in to get more information? Or is it more like an algorithmic or algorithm on this person? whose job it is to uh, be aware of how algorithms are being used to construct the media and then communicate to that, that to the public. Um, or maybe it's something more like a transparency report, which um, uh, a number of companies are, are now um, publishing uh, on a quarterly basis. So these are the kind of the questions that we talk about in different focus groups. Uh, and I won't go into all the detail, but I'll just kind of say that you know, based on the analysis of all of those conversations, we transcribed everything, we you know, reported it, transcribed it, and analyzed it in kind of a qualitative methodology, uh, and came out with this kind of understanding of um, different layers at which we could disclose information, or from which we could disclose information. So we could certainly tell people about the data that we used in our system. We could tell people about the model and how we built the model. We could tell people about inferences, like, classification decisions, and perhaps benchmarks, like how many false positives or false negatives uh, occur. Uh, and we could um, think about the interface uh, level of algorithmic transparency, uh, and perhaps providing some interactivity there. Across all these, um, what was very clear from the focus groups was that uh, humans are deeply embedded in these systems, right? Um, it's uh, rhetorically, uh, corporate America likes to say, oh, it's all automated. Well, <laughs> I just saw this really funny article. I don't know if it's funny or not. It kind of made me smile. Uh, this morning, uh, published on Bloomberg, where uh, basically it was about the chatbot craze and how you know people are making AI chatbots that uh, you can interact with autonomously to say, you know, order me a burrito, and it will go out and like get you a Chipotle burrito or something like that. So this article that Bloomberg published um, either this morning or yesterday was basically blowing the lid off that, saying, uh, actually, there's people behind all these services, and in some cases, dozens of people, whose job it is to monitor all the messages coming into these uh, systems and then connect the dots and make, make it seem like it's a bot, but actually there's a human uh, in the box. Um, so, so corporate America loves this, uh, this rhetoric of saying, oh, it's just the algorithm, it's automatic. Because that's how they raise capital, right? I mean, you can walk into a venture capital, a venture capitalist, and say, "Oh, we figured out how to automate this," and all of a sudden, it's worth a lot more than if you say, "Well, we have to hire like 100 people to do this." So anyway, and rant, um, but certainly human involvement is is very embedded in all of these layers, uh, and something that's important to think about how you disclose that human involvement. So we're trying to uh, eat our own dog food uh, in my lab, the computational journalism lab at University of Maryland. So uh, I mentioned this Uber study. Um, that's all up on GitHub. Um, so it's open source. You can see the data that we collected. You can see how we collected it, sampled it. You can see all of our analysis step by step uh, to see uh, how we did it, how we came up with those results. Um, so we're essentially trying to apply this transparency model to our own work. We also build news bots in my lab. So here's an example of a news bot that we built called Init Bottle NYT. Uh, what it is is it's a, it's a Twitter bot. It listens to people tweeting for New York Times links. And um, if you tweet a link, it'll then go see if there are more than 100 comments on that article on the website. Uh, and if there are, it'll grab all those comments, and it'll rank them according to a set of scores uh, that we've defined to try to identify anecdotal comments or personal experiences that people have shared. Uh, and then based on that ranking, it will pick one of those randomly and respond to the person who tweeted the link with uh, the comment that was left on the site. So it's kind of an attempt to uh, build a bridge between the New York Times comment themselves and Twitter. Uh, and in the same way as for the Uber story, we're kind of uh, trying to apply this transparency model. If you go to GitHub, you can see um, 
written an entire section on editorial transparency that explains the data that's used, the model that's built, and how it's presented in the interface. So we're trying to create examples of best practices of how to apply this model. There's definitely some challenges that came up in the conversation. So business concerns are chief amongst those challenges. There's costs for information production of transparency information. Someone has to prepare the data that you're going to open source. Someone has to document it. Someone might have to run benchmarking studies. That's all expensive. There could be privacy issues. We don't want to necessarily publish information in a transparency capacity that undermines personal privacy. There could be legal issues. So if I'm using a classifier in my news reporting, and I know that that classifier is 80% uncertain, or 80% certain, which means 20% uncertain, but I publish it anyway, if there's some kind of legal ramification to that, like maybe a defamation suit, that could come back and haunt the company because they could say, well, you knew that it wasn't, you weren't 100% sure when you published that information there was some uncertainty there. So this is a real concern. We had some lawyers participating in this workshop. And certainly trade secrets are a competitive advantage, right? So corporations don't necessarily want to disclose all the details of how their valuable technologies work. There's also the question of cognitive complexity. So the more transparency information we generate to disclose, the more we have to worry about overloading the end user, right? So we need to come up with ways to provide that transparency information in an accessible and understandable capacity. So I've been working on that a little bit in terms of designing interfaces for transparency information. This is an example, actually the 2014 version, there's a 2015 version, and there'll be a 2016 version this year, published with Spectrum Magazine. That's the professional organization magazine for the IEEE Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers. So basically it's the largest professional organization for electrical engineers, and they wanted me to build a ranking of programming languages. So we have 12 different data sources that are feeding into this ranking, and those data sources are weighted in different ways in order to come up with this kind of default IEEE Spectrum ranking. Now what's interesting about this ranking is that there's other weightings that you can also apply. So you can re-weight the ranking based on what languages might be most important for job hunting or for open source development. So you can click those buttons to re-rank and re-weight. You can also step into the ranking and tweak the data sources that are feeding it. So you can re-weight different things, you can turn different sources on and off. And finally, we provide some feedback, some visualization feedback, so that you can see, based on your edited version of that ranking, how does it compare back to other weightings of the ranking. So you can see how much up or down a particular language moves in the ranking. So again, trying to play with how we disclose an algorithmic system, in this case a ranking, so that people can understand and play with it and see inside that box a little bit. So some initial encouraging results that I wanted to share with you. This is based on a fairly small end, about 30 people who took a survey. So on this system, we put a link to a survey and had people answer some questions about whether or not they used different features of the system, like whether or not they clicked on one of these different weightings, or whether or not they changed the weightings there, or whether or not they looked at the comparison. So we put a survey on this and we asked people, so it's self-reported. But some kind of interesting initial results here. So if you look at people who edited ranking weights for the data source, we had them rate on a scale from 1 to 5, the objectivity, trustworthiness, accuracy, informativeness, authoritativeness, bias, and relevance. In gray, you see people who didn't interact with this feature, and in pink, you see people who did interact. So that's not a very strong effect, but you can see a little bit of a trend where people who interacted with that feature actually thought it was more objective, more trustworthy, more accurate, and so on. Different feature, so this is for people who actually looked at the comparison visualization. 
you see a little bit stronger effect that some of these are actually statistically significant uh, of, of the use of that feature leading to people thinking it was more objective and trustworthy. And of course, on the other hand, we wanted to assess whether or not providing these features uh, undermined the user experience. Did, was it overwhelming for people? So we asked them questions like, was it pleasant to use? Was it uh, satisfying, easy to use? Was it interesting, and so on. Uh, and you see similar types of trends. Um, none of these differences are actually statistically significant, but uh, that might not be important. I think what we were testing for was, uh, is you know, do these features undermine the user experience? And basically, the user experience is more or less unchanged by providing these features. So again, this is kind of early evidence, and there's lots more research to do in this domain to figure out what are the right ways to present transparency information around algorithms so that we don't kill the user experience and so that we maintain trust and legitimacy of the people. So in closing, just to wrap up, I just want to reiterate um, algorithmic accountability reporting is a response to the power of the algorithms in the field of society. I think it's very important for journalists to get involved with this. Of course, there are others. Computer scientists are now getting involved with this. So uh, if you yourself are, aren't a computational journalist, maybe you can collaborate uh, with some computer scientists and do this kind of work. Uh, I think algorithmic transparency is fascinating. It's certainly uh, one route to accountability of these types of systems. I'm not saying it's it's the end-all, be-all. It definitely has some weaknesses, um, but I think it's worth doing additional research on, on that, seeing where it shines. Uh, and just a plug for my workshop tomorrow. So tomorrow at 4 p.m., um, come hang out for an hour. We'll be thinking through and brainstorming actual investigations that we might undertake. So with, with that, I'm happy to take a few questions if we have a few minutes. I know we're running a little long here. You're simply welcome to get in touch. And um, I've referenced a few research papers and presentation that you might want to read more to. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, any quick questions here? So, um, Nick has all of his works on his web page, so it's, it's very open and transparent for all, all of us. And from the other organizers behind, I will give you this little present. We have made a special device. It's mobile. It's suitable for mobile devices. Like it's something I think you can figure out. No problem at all. Uh, it's called the uh, Well, I have another device for you as well. Thank you. We're looking in the morning, so we can figure out what's that. I think very easily. And uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, any questions? everyone wants to bring it. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, okay. This this uh, problem of transparency and uh, agreement and accountability. Do you see this mainly as a problem for basically us in the room as researcher, or is this something that you would like to educate a little small army of? Uh, Oh, I think this is for everyone. This is for uh, people to become more literate about algorithms that they're encountering on a daily basis. So in, in classes, I teach people how to poke and prod algorithms on Facebook and Uber and, and get them to try to respond, get the algorithms to respond to you. Um, it's for the researchers in the room. I think it's, uh, there's a number of interesting research questions here about you know, transparency and how to do that properly and what are the, you know, what's the impact of that transparency and so on. Uh, and it's also for computer science researchers, I think, who are doing uh, things like um, internet measurement. So every year at the internet measurement conference, you see a few papers that are doing these types of studies where they're kind of using a lot of data about an algorithmic system to, to understand it. Uh, and I definitely want to train the army of journalists uh, to go out and do this kind of work. But it's, this is really hard stuff. Um, you, you need a very strong uh, basis in computing, in programming, in data manipulation, uh, in, in scientific thinking in order to set up experiments and, and analyze them. Um, so you know, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think it's a, it's a long trajectory to get the uh, I guess the pedagogy there to, to train up people who can do this kind of work um, in the future. Uh, but there are some news outlets that are doing it now, and uh, certainly there's interest at University of Maryland and Columbia 
uh, and show other places in training journalists how to do this. Has there been any, any discussion about this freedom of information uh, requests considering algorithms or software or stuff like that? Is it like, has the public officials sort of confessed that yes, this is an important issue, we should, you know, weigh trade, trade secrets and stuff are of course important, but this is also important, or is it just something they don't really get yet? I haven't gotten a satisfying response from a government official about this. Um, I'm not even sure it's on their radar, to be yeah. quite honest with you. I, there's been some rec recent research by um, Kate Fink. Uh, you might want to look her up. Um, she published a paper a few weeks ago where she actually FOIA the FOIA about algorithms. So she asked the government for all the documents where people ask for algorithms and then, and then analyzed the reasons for rejection or or actually um, disclosing information. But at least there were FOIAs about algorithms. There were, yes. Um, there's not, you know, thousands, but I think there's hundreds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the, you showed the course of general investigation, but uh, you said the other news that outlets that are using this sort of, they do this sort of reporting algorithms. Can you give an example? Yeah, so ProPublica um, has run some stories. Um, they had a story not too long ago where they were looking at price variations of um, test preparation services. So if I search for, I, th I think it was SAT prep, so that's the big standardized test in the US. Uh, if you search for that, they were looking at the price that you were presented uh, um, on the site in relationship to your zip code. And they kind of came up with this interesting relationship between certain zip codes were seeing higher prices, other zip codes lower prices, and there was a relationship there between race. So if you're Asian, you, you're more likely to see a higher price, for instance, for that service. So there are some outlets that are starting to publish these types of studies. I'd, I'd love to see more out. I'd love to see some outlets in Europe. If anyone knows examples of um, European outlets doing this type of work, uh, I'd love to bring those back to the US with me and tell other people about them. So it is. <laughs> <laughs> next year, next year when I come back. All right, I think we can close here. Uh, I thank you all. Uh, very good work. In my point of view, we get some extra minutes, but you know, the reception hall is just right around the corner, so no, no worries at all. Uh, about the academic papers, if you want to have the full papers, like Eric wants, uh, you can directly ask from the authors if they want to send. Uh, otherwise, we are uh, going through with, with Esther these papers and uh, maybe publishing uh, a special edition in the Journal of Media Innovations later this year. So, thank you all. Thanks.